Hello, everyone, and welcome to the remainder of Chapter 20 for pathogenic gram-negative um, bacteria. Today, we are going to start off with talking about the very last group of our enterics, where we had um, the truly pathogenic, so before we talked about things that were coliform, opportunistic, enterobacterase, um, and those were things like E. coli and serratia and Sideroobacter. And then we talked about non-coliform, which remember this coliform aspect directly relates to the ability or inability to ferment lactose. Coliform fermenters or coliform bacteriaes are able to ferment lactose while non-coliform bacteriaes, enterobacteriaes are not. So examples of that we use were Proteus, Morganella, uh, Providencia, and Edwardsiella. Um, we're examples of that, and now we're in that third group of faculty anaerobic bacilli or enterobacteriaes that are truly pathogenic. So the three that we're going to talk about are Shigella, Salmonella, and Yersinia, Yersinia pestis. Um, almost all of these are always pathogenic because they have lots of virulence factors. And remember, we talked about what a virulence factor is. It's something that allows for it to evade any aspect of your immune system. Um, they make these type 3 secretions, and those type 3 secretions are like that shiga toxin that we talked about E. coli 0157H7 is able to produce. Um, and as a result of this type 3 secretion, they are able to um, inhibit phagocytosis for the host cells, so for the person that is infected with these bacteria. It can rearrange the cytoskeletons of your eukaryotic cells, so the movement of any enzymes or lysozymes is going to be impeded, and thus so will any immune properties of that cell, um, and also for the cell to behave like it should, it's going to be completely um, um, screwed up. And they can also induce apoptosis, which if you probably remember from an introductory biology course, that is just programmed cell death. So the first one we're going to talk about is salmonella. Um, it is gram-negative, obviously. It's the paratrixis bacilli, which means that it has cilia, or not cilia, um, flagella that are all around it. Um, we find it living in pretty much all birds. Uh, that includes chickens, so when you saw salmonella, the Probably one thing that came up with undercooked poultry or chicken. So we find it in basically all birds, reptiles, um, and there are some mammals that have it. And the way that the bacteria moves, that it can be eliminated through the feces. Except we find this is in the intestine of these. Um, the bacteria they don't ferment lactose, so they would be considered non-coliform, but they do ferment glucose. Um, and when they do this, they usually have some sort of gas production um, that comes with that. Most human infections that we find are the result of contamin consuming contaminated food that has been contaminated with animal feces. Um, we see it a lot of time for people that have lots of cases of salmonella um, poisoning or infections for people that have pet reptiles and they don't properly wash their hands or don't have proper hygiene and they can um, contract it that way. Um, the food pathogens also common in foods such as poultry or eggs, which we talked about. Um, about 33% of chicken eggs are contaminated, and salmonella that's released during the cracking of an egg on a kitchen counter can be inoculated into other foods very quickly. Um, it can cause what we call salmonellaosis, which is a non-bloody diarrhea, causes nausea, vomiting, um, fever, malaise, um, muscle pain, headaches, abdominal cramps. Um, this happens after salmonella passes through the stomach, and then they will actually align to the intestines. Um, the bacteria then uses the type 3 secretions to insert proteins in the host cells, the host cells, the host cells that will induce um, these non phagocytotic cells to endocytize the bacteria, and then the salmonella can reproduce inside these cells, and it can eventually kill the cell itself. Um, we are the sole host of salmonella enterica, which is a different stereotype than like the salmonella that we're talking about that um, these birds are traditionally carrying, these reptiles carry. And this type of salmonella can actually cause typhoid fever, which is a milder form of typhoid fever, um, but the infections usually occur as a result of ingestion of this um, bacteria. So here's a lovely little picture that's showing the coursework of how we have salmonellaosis taking place, where the um, pull out the finger here. What are you doing now? There we go. 
So where we have the Salmonella and Moses paratrixis, it has those flagella all around it, um, attaches to the lining of the intestines, those epithelial cells, and then because it's attaching to the lining of those intestines, it's going to trigger the cell to endocytize it, um, so it brings it into the cell, and instead of it just merging, merging with a lysosome and becoming a phagolysosome complex and breaking down, the salmonella instead, what it's going to do is it's going to um, kill that host cell and as a result lead to all the, the, the things that we just talked about, the fever, the um, diarrhea, the cramps, and then it can make its way into the bloodstream after it's replicated inside the host cell. So typhoid fever, as we talked about, caused by Salmonella enterica, um, the serial type typhi, typhi the only host for this particular um, type of Salmonella. Um, carriers a lot of time are asymptomatic. As I said before, it's a much milder case of typhoid fever, and the way that people become infected with this is that the bacteria is found in contaminated food or water. The bacteria can pass through the intestines into the bloodstream, and the cytotypetic cells um, ingest the bacteria and carry it into various different organs, so it can not only cause gastroenteritis, but it can also cause bacteremia and peritonitis because of its ability to move to various different orders, organs after it gets into the bloodstream. So in this picture here, we're looking at the incidences of cases of salmonella in the United States. Um, we have the incidence of typhoid fever has declined, and the reason for that is because a lot of times the way that typhoid fever is um, transmitted is through unsanitary practices such as not washing your hands or contaminated food or water. So with better sewage waste treatment facilities, we see the incidence of typhoid fever going down dramatically from the 1930s to where we are today in 2016. However, um, the incidence of reported cases of salmonella has increased, um, and we see that that increase has taken place there um, because of many different cases of it, and a lot of it is undercooked poultry or um, food-based poisoning. So that's one reason why we see an increase in, in the, even though typhoid fever has gone down, but the cases of salmonella, um, and especially with the fact that we have these large-scale corporate farmings that's taking place. There's no longer we have these smaller-scale corporate or smaller-scale farms or family farms. They're mostly corporate farms, and a lot of times the animals are not always housed in the most hygienic conditions. So there's a lot of runoff from the waste that contaminates the food. So on to sugar um, in the it has a sugar toxin. It's in the um, Shigella is the genus that we're talking about. These are also gram negative. They're oxidase. They're non-motile, unlike the salmonella that is paratrixis and motile. Um, these are a family of enterobacteriates that are primarily parasites of human digestive tracts. Um, the bacteria produce diarrhea-inducing endotoxin, and they are urease negative. Um, they don't produce hydrogen sulfide gas, and some people actually suggest that the Shigella may actually be a strain of E. coli that's become non-motile and oxidase negative, while there are other researchers that say that Shigella was an invasive, toxin-producing version of E. coli that's cloaked in the Shigella antigen. So um, there's kind of, we're kind of on the fence as to whether or not we're all in agreement is whether or not this is its own um, very specific, unique type of bacteria all along, or if it's just a modification of E. coli. That's what we're saying for the most part. Um, there are four well-defined species of Shigella. We have Shigella dysenteria, which causes very, very um, aggressive bouts of dysentery or diarrhea, um, Shigella flexniari, Shigella boidii, and Shigella somnii. Shigella osis is a very severe form of dysentery, um, characterized by abdominal cramps, fever, diarrhea, pus-containing um, diarrhea, bloody stools. It's primarily associated with poor personal hygiene and also ineffective sewage treatment. 
when people become affected, um, it's primary as a result of ingesting the bacteria or their own contaminated hands and then con or consuming contaminated food. Um, Shigella literally um, affects the stomach acid, so an ineffective dose might just take a couple hundred cells. So as a result, person-to-person -person contact is spread very easily, and that's specifically true among children because they kind of don't have the best hand washing techniques and the best hand washing practices sometimes, and they will scratch certain neither regions of their body, and then they will put their hands on other people. Um, case in point, when my daughter was about four years old, she was playing outside with the neighbor kid, and she had her hand in his mouth. And I said, why do you have your hand in Josiah's mouth? And she said, Josiah asked me to put my hand in her mouth. And who knows where her hand was prior to being in Josiah's mouth. But that's one of the reasons why this is person-to-person um, -person contact spreads very easily. So what happened is that um, uh, we have different these different classes of Shigella that can cause these different types of dysentery. Shigella sonii is mostly in industrialized nations. That's where we, we, we see that more in the U.S. Um, Shigella sexuinary happens more in developing countries. And as I said before, all of this is kind of associated with poor hygiene, poor sewage treatment, and contamination in either the, on the hands or in the food. So for the spread of it, um, the first thing the Shigella does is it will colonize the cells of the small intestine, and then they cause um, what's considered enteral toxin-mediated diarrhea. The basic events that are happening here is that after it attaches to the epithelial cells of the large intestine, the cells are going to be stimulated to um, endocytize the bacteria, kind of the same way we saw with salmonella, then it'll multiply within the cell cytosol. Um, it's a little bit different here because with salmonella, it was able to reproduce inside the endocytotic vesicle. Um, with Shigella, it's able to multiply within just the cytoplasm of the cell itself. After that, um, the sugar then is going to, the Shigella then causes the actin fibers or part of the cytoskeleton of the cell to push the bacteria out of the host cell. So remember we said one of those virulence factors of these truly pathogenic um, enterobacteriaceae that they can, some of them can actually alter the cytoskeleton of um, the host cell. So this is a direct example of that. So as it's kind of, so after the cytoskeleton has been um, changed somewhat from by the bacteria, it pushes the bacteria out of the host cell and into the neighboring cells. In that process of pushing from one cell to the next, it's directly evading your immune system. So your white blood cells your um, antibodies, your T cells, any of those are not going to detect it because it's gone from one cell to the next cell. Um, as the bacteria kills the host cell, then you have these abscesses form in the mucosis, mucosa of the large intestine, and then any bacteria that enter the blood from these ruptured abscesses will be quickly phagocytized and, and destroyed. So we don't really see a whole lot of bacteremia happening with shigellaosis um, simply because once they can be detected by the immune system, the immune system very quickly um, gets rid of it. Shigella dysenteria secretes the endotoxin called the shiga toxin that we talked about, and just like for E. coli 0157H7, um, it stops protein synthesis in the host cell, and um, it can be fatal for people um, because it has stopped that protein synthesis. So the sugar toxin is secreted by Shigella dysentery, um, as we, and once again, it causes these very, very dramatic pronounced bouts of dysentery or diarrhea and bloody stools, and it can be fatal. Um, stops protein synthesis in the host cell, very important aspect to remember about the sugar toxin, specifically since we've talked about it not only with Shigella, but also with that specific strain of E. coli 0157H7. Um, produces severe diarrhea, as we talk about, a severe disease. Um, shigellaosis is typically self-limiting, um, stay hydrated, as with most bouts of diarrhea or dysentery. Being hydrated is a very crucial portion uh, part of, of, of healing and of treatment, and a lot of times it's just shed in the, um, in the stool. It's just going to be shed out of the body.
and hopefully into a sewage waste facility where it can be properly treated and you don't have to deal with that again or anyone else in your family. Your Yersinia um, is the next truly pathogenic enterobacteriaceae we will talk about. Um, it is a normal pathogen of animals and there are three important species that we're going to talk about and they all have these virulent plasmids which means that they can be genes for being virulent or being um, able to cause disease very easily are found in these plasmids. They have adhesions as part of the virulence factors or genes, which means it allows it to attach to human cells. They have those type 3 secretins that we talked about with both Shigella and Salmonella. Um, and these type 3 secretions, their specific role is not making that sugar toxin that we talked about, but it's the injection of protein that can cause the host cell to undergo apoptosis, specifically for those that have macrophages and neutrophils. And remember, apoptosis is programmed cell death. So the three different species that we will talk about are Yersinia enterocolida, Yersinia um, pseudotuberculosis, and then Yersinia pestis. The one you're probably most familiar with or probably heard of before is Yersinia pestis, which is the street name for that is the Black Pit Plague or the Bubonic Plague. Of the three groups of Yersinia that we're talking about here, um, Yersinia pestis is the most virulent um, and it is the most um, problematic, it's gotten the most press, I should say. Yersinia intercolorida is acquired by consumption of contaminated food or water. It causes inflammation of the intestinal tract, um, usually self-limiting. Yersinia pseudotuberculosis um, causes a less severe inflammation of the intestines. And then with Yersinia pestis, um, that's the one that is extremely virulent. It's a non enteric pathogenic bacteria um, that causes the bubonic plague and pneumonic plague, um, which is another major uh, pandemic. So the natural history of Yersinia um, pestis, so the, uh, the Black Plague, uh, remember that we had the fleas would bite the rats um, and then the rats would have direct contact because of the poor sanitary conditions that during the, this time um, it was not very uncommon for an individual to have rats just running around their house and it was kind of a, a normal thing, if you will. Um, so there was very close direct contact for people that um, were in contact with these rats. So um, fleas biting the rats and the fleas could also bite the humans and the fleas would be the ones that were transmitting this disease. Um, the lymph nodes would become inflamed. They'd have lots of this bacteria would make their way to the lymph nodes and it causes this bulbul, which is a swollen lymph node because it's infected. And that's one of the hallmark features of the um, bubonic plague. So the major pandemic of the plague lasted from about the mid 500 AD to the late 700. Um, they say that it's claimed more than 40 million lives and that it is uh, it was a far reaching. Um, there is more than just one plague that we talk about. There have been pandemics of this. It's happened on a couple of market times in history. Um, as early as the um, 1860s, when it claimed about 10 million more lives, um, that the understanding that we have not gotten quite rid of Yersinia pestis um, is an understatement. Uh, because we do see, we don't see mass pandemics as we saw before because we have antibiotics and we don't have the same types of living conditions or, or better living conditions that we'd be able to, to deal with it better. But um, we do find that um, the Yersinia pestis is naturally found in the southwest United States. So it's not like it's completely gone. And here's a picture of that bobo. Um, and sometimes they can become black as a result of it. And that's what they have called the black death. Um, 
characteristics of the plague are not only just these painful lymph nodes called buboes, but high fever. Um, usually within a week of the infection we get that. Untreated cases will progress to bacteremia, which results in the disseminated intravascular coagulation, subcutaneous hemorrhaging, and the death of the tissues. Um, so it kind of looks like a colostridium um, infection, and sometimes it can be infected, become infected with colostridium, and develop gangrene. And then we have that intense darkening of the skin, and that's why they called it the black death. Um, if left untreated, the bubonic plague is fatal in about 50% of the cases. And even with treatment, sometimes up to 15% of the patients die. Um, in fatal injections, death usually occurs within a week when symptoms onset. So the other type of plague we have is that um, pneumonic plague, and that's going to be spread through air droplets. Um, and when it spreads through air droplets, it gets into the bloodstream, it affects the lungs. It's going to develop much more rapidly than the bubonic plague that we looked at before, where we have the rat, rats and mice involved as the host for it, and then the fleas will bite them, and then they bite other rats or they bite humans. Um, this one is kind of through air droplets, and it's going to happen much more quickly. So the diagnosis and treatment of it, because it does happen very quickly, it can be spread from person to person through aerosol sputum um, very quickly. And in fact, for the pneumonic version of the plague, the pneumonic plague, it's actually about 100% fatal in nearly all cases. Diagnosis must be very um, quick, so it must be rapid, and also must treatment be rapid. Um, characteristic symptoms, especially in patients that have traveled to areas where the plague is endemic, um, are usually just enough for diagnosis. Rat control, as we said before, better personal hygiene has pretty much eliminated the plague in most industrialized countries, specifically um, ours. Um, all the wild animals have been reservoirs. As I said before, we go to the southwest um, United States, we do see animals that are still reservoirs for it. Um, we have a vaccine for it that's been tested in humans, but it's not commercially available. And we do have lots of antimicrobial drugs, including streptomycin, drentromycin, doxycycline, cyclofloraxin, and others um, that are effective against it. So um, sites of infection by some common members of enterobacteres. We have the central nervous system that can be affected with Escherichia, E. coli, lower respiratory tract with the Klebsiella, Enterobacter, um, E. coli, and Yersinia, bloodstream to cause bacteremia from E. coli, Klebsiella, or Enterobacter, um, gastrointestinal tract by Shigella, Salmonella, um, Escherichia coli, and Yersinia, and urinary tract infections by Proteus, Klebsiella, Morganella, and um, Escheria. So these are just some common sites of infection um, for these different classes of enterobacteria that we've talked about. So on to our gram-negative um, faculty enterobacteria. Um, the uh, next group that we are going to be talking about are the um, pastorellase. Um, the first one that we'll talk about is Haemophilus, or Haemophilus influenza. Um, Haemophilus influenza species are usually small, and they're what we consider cleomorphic bacilli, um, and they have a little bit different growth requirement um, than others. Um, the Haemophilus influenza type B um, is the most significant strain. It can cause meningitis. We do have a vaccination for it. Um, in fact, newborns usually get this before they even leave the hospital. The hip vaccination has eliminated most of the disease within um, the United States, but um, there are other Haemophilus strains that can actually cause a lot of diseases too, including conjunctivitis, cyanitis, dental abscesses, um, and even meningitis. Next one we'll talk about is Bruce. Yellow, Brosiella, which is also a small non motile aerobic coxobacilli. Um, doesn't really have a capsule, but it can survive phagocytosis by preventing the phagolysosome, phagosome lysosome fusion um, of it. In animal hosts, the bacteria lives as an intercellular parasite in places like the uterus, the placenta, and the epididymis, but these organs are not always, but these organs are not infected in humans. Typically, infections and animals are either asymptomatic or cause a mild disease. 
Um, it can be thought because they can affect those reproductive organs, can cause sterility or abortion um, because they affect those different places. Um, Versiella is, um, we do have a vaccination for undomestic animals. Um, humans are usually infected from contact with contaminated dairy products or infected animal parts. Um, the bacteria then enters the body through breaks in the mucous membrane in the digestive tract. Um, and it can cause a fever, what we call a fluctuating fever. Um, and that's why it's called an undulate fever. It kind of goes through these periods of chills and sweating and headaches, um, muscle weakness and weight loss. Um, and the disease in humans has been given a, a lot of different names. Most of the time, um, the brucella that affects humans is brucella melitinus. And here is a nice little slide of the incidence of brucella in the United States. The decline is largely as a result of um, improvement in livestock management and vaccination. So Bordetella is our next one, Bordetella pertussis, small aerobic non-motile brand negative crop with the um, It is responsible for the disease known as pertussis or the whooping cough. Most of the time that we see pertussis cases that they're happening in children, um, and they're usually in children that have been not have been vaccinated. Um, it does have these virulent factors of adhesions and toxins that help to mediate the disease. There's the pertussis to toxin, the adenylate cyclase, toxin, uh, the demonocrotic, dermonocrotic toxin, and the tracheocytotoxin, all of which help to damage those um, epithelial cells that line the trachea or that line the respiratory passages and keeps the, especially the tracheocytotoxin, um, inhibits the movement of the cilia, the respiratory tract to kind of move that thing out. We usually consider pertussis to be like a child disease. Um, because most cases are reported in children that are under five years old. Um, there are millions of children worldwide that can contract this disease. Uh, pertussis begins when bacteria is inhaled in aerosols. They attach and multiply in epithelial cells, and it progressively goes through different stages. It has the incubation stage, um, the catarrhal stage, and the proxosomal stage, and then the convalescent stage that it can go through. So here is a picture of kind of pertussis cases over the years. Notice that there's a huge drop that we have between the 70s and the 90s. And then we start to see cases start to tick and to pick up a little bit. One of the reasons for that is because um, around this time, there was the belief and um, that vaccinations, and specifically around the time that the DTaP vaccination was given for diphtheria uh, and pertussis, acellular um, pertussis or whooping cough were given that it caused autism. So a lot of parents were choosing not to vaccinate their children. And what we then see is an uptick or a rise in, um, in pertussis and whooping cough that we find in the United States. So here are the epithelial cells. Um, that we saw it attached to the, the ciliated epithelial cells, and then we have the Bordetella um, pertussis kind of attaching to them. So for those different phases, um, the first seven to ten days are what we call the incubation period. The bacteria are multiplying, but they're not really causing any visible symptoms. Um, the catarrhal stage is characterized by um, signs and symptoms that kind of look like the common cold. This phase usually lasts one or two weeks, and the bacteria are the most abundant at this point. Um, runny nose, sneezing, fever, um, general weakness, and the, the person is most in, um, infectious at this point. The proxosomal stage begins with the ciliary action of the tracheal cells being compromised. They can't work anymore. So you get a bunch of mucus that's secreted, but the cells aren't able to move it or push it out. So to clear the accumulating mucus, the body is going to have be triggered to have these deep coughs, which kind of gives that oh, oh, that whooping sound um, as you're taking air into that trachea that's not been congested with all of this mucus. So every day the patient is going to have these 
razor coughing spells, and a lot of times they can end in being exhausted because you have these huge coughing spells, um, and it's taken a lot of energy to do that on top of having an infection. This phase can last two to four weeks, and the coughing can be so severe that oxygen exchange is so, so severely limited that people can turn blue and they can actually die, become asphyxiated by not able to get enough air in there. In the convalescence phase, the cough diminishes, um, and you could possibly have some secondary complications with things like streptococcus or staphylococcus um, because of the damaged epithelium. It may lead to bacteria being in the blood, be lead to pneumonia, seizures, or encephalopathy. So diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Diagnosis, pertussis symptoms are usually very diagnostic. It's very easy um, to, to see this, um, uh, the way that we can say for sure that this is Bordetella. Um, treatment is usually supportive um, treatment. Uh, by the time that it's usually recognized by the distinctive cause, your immune system has pretty much won the battle. Um, recovery most often is just needing the tracheal epithelium to regenerate itself. And prevention, we have the DTAP for um, diphtheria, tetanus, and attenuated um, per, um, wartella pertussis. And that vaccination is given part of just your normal childhood vaccination schedule. So the last one that we're going to talk about are pseudomons, which are aerobic bacilli found in the soil, decaying organic matter, and moist environments. Very problematic in hospitals because they can live in things like saline solution. Um, they can live in places that um, most things don't like to live in. Um, and it is also an opportunistic pathogen, and it's also been known to cause, and we find it's very problematic for, for burn victims. And it also is known to cause a swimmer's ear, an external swimming ear infection. Pseudomonas originosum is usually not a part of your normal microbiota. However, it also rarely causes disease, despite having lots of virulence factors like fenbrae, adhesions, capsules, toxins, and various different types of enzymes. Um, it's usually an infection and takes opportunity of someone's immune system that has been uh, uh, compromised, and it can pretty much colonize the, any organ or system. Um, we've also seen for people that have cystic fibrosis, they can have this biofilm of pseudomonas because they have these fembrae and these adhesions that allow it to attach to the cells um, that protect it from vagocytosis. And because pseudomonas can live in so many different places, um, that's one of the reasons why it's difficult to treat it with, um, you know, any types of drugs. It kind of has some drug resistance. So what we're looking at here is um, a bacteria that's growing under the bandages of a burn victim. And the characteristics that we see here are that green color. So notice that green color there. For pseudomonas that grows on the plate in the lab, you're probably very familiar with it. It has a very distinctive green color to it. Um, it makes your plates turn or look green. And we see that underneath um, the uh, bandages here. And what causes it to be green is what's called um, a pyrocytosin. It's a blue-green pyramid that's secreted by the pseudomonas that causes this color. Moraxoella and Acentobacter are aerobic short plump bacteria. These also, like Pseudomonas arginosum, rarely cause disease. Um, Moraxoella is an opportunistic pathogen that causes infections of the sinuses, the bronchi, the ears, and the lungs. Um, Acentobacter grows in soil and water sewage, also opportunistic pathogen, um, primarily affects the respiratory tract, urinary tract, and it can also infect the central nervous system. When it does that, um, endocarditis and septemia are also reported in these cinobacter infections. And it too, like Pseudomonas arginosa, it can be resistant to lots of antimicrobial drugs. So they have to do the susceptibility test to see which treatment is the most effective. Legionella is our next one. Um, 
Aerobic slender pleomorphic bacteria usually inhabits the water. Um, humans inhale the bacteria from the aerosols of the water sources. It is also an intracellular par parasite, and Legionella um, pneumophilia causes most disease in humans. And what we're looking at here is this is the Legionella that's growing on buffer charcoal yeast extract. Um, and so it takes a special type of media to grow it. Causes Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire's disease is characterized by uh, pneumonia, can be fatal, especially for people that are immunocompromised. Um, we, after doing a lot of epidemiological, epidemiological research, the disease Legionnaire's disease was found as a way to classify the pathogen. Um, we know of about 40 different species of Legionella um, uh, that we have been able to classify thus far. Pontiac fever is similar to Legionella's disease, um, however, it does not produce pneumonia and it's not fatal the same way that we saw Legionnaire's disease was. Legionnaire's disease is characterized by fevers, chills, dry, non-productive cough, headache, and pneumonia. Um, complications can involve the gastrointestinal tract, even the central nervous system, liver, kidneys. Um, if it's not properly treated, um, we can have um, more pulmonary function decrease very quickly, and it results in deaths in about 20% of patients that have a normal immunity. If your immunity is much lower than that, it's going to have a, a higher chance or a higher mortality rate. So the diagnosis of the disease, um, identification of it, the Legionella by antibody staining, or there are other serological tests that we can use. For treatment for it, Pontiac fever, which is the kind of the milder case of Legionnaire's disease, it doesn't, um, or Legionella doesn't result in um, pneumonia, usually self-limiting. Fluoroquinoline um, and uh, Azorbicin are used to treat Legionnaire's disease. So those are the ones that we typically could use to treat for people that have Pontiac. Um, more self-limiting. And then prevention. Well, prevention is not as easy as it would sound because completely eliminating um, Legionella from the water side, water supply is not going to be feasible. However, coordination and heating of it um, can be successful, but the bacterium is so virulent that reducing its numbers greatly is our best form of defense. Coxiella, um, small aerobic bacteria, they're also obligate intercellular parasites. We used to think that they were um, viruses, but they're not viruses because they are intercellular parasites. Um, ineffective bodies enable it to survive in very harsh conditions. It has these different um, modes that it can kind of switch into. It has like the small cell variant and this large cell variant, and the small cell variants act a lot like endospores. Um, human disease is associated typically with farm animals and pets, and it is inhaled, or it's transmitted by the inhalation of these ineffective bodies, or what we call, can call these small cell variants. So here is a nice little picture of an ineffective uh, body. Um, Coxiella's infections can be asymptomatic, um, but the one that we're going to talk about is Q fever. Um, it's called Q fever because it was questionable for many years. Um, it occurs worldwide, usually among ranchers and veteran veterinarians, people that handle animals. Acute Q fever follows an incubation period of a couple of about 20 days, and you have fever, severe headaches, chills, muscle pains, and pneumonia. And chronic Q fever, which happens for months or years. Um, it may pass from time of infection until a life-threatening endocarditis happens. Um, it can also result in inflammation of the lungs and the liver, and that may happen simultaneously. And Q fever can be treated with long-term um, antimicrobials. There's a vaccine that's developed, but it's not yet available in the United States. And treatment for that, uh, I'm not sorry, treatment that the antibiotic we use for is doxycycline with another antibiotic. Um, researchers have developed a, a vaccine for it, but as I said before, it's not available in the United States. The best prevention is just avoiding 
the inhalation of dust that's contaminated in barnyards and by um, pet waste. All right, so that is the end of chapter 20, and we will come back for chapter 21 with Ricochetia, Chlamydia, Spirochetes, and Vibroglycolera. Woohoo! All right, so we will see you soon. Have a great morning, noon, or night.